Women make up 70% of the healthcare workforce, but only 20% of its leadership. On her story, we'll explore the careers of bold and influential women from Silicon Valley to Capitol Hill and learn how they've overcome the odds. I'm your host, Sandra Jane, and this is Her Story, a program where we explore what's beyond the glass ceiling. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Beneath Aurora, who's the newly appointed Dean of Medical Education and Professor of Medicine at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. Vinny, thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you back as kind of part two of this Her Story series. I know you're one of our first guests in season one with our guest host, Cece, and it's great to follow up with you on uh, this most recent announcement of your new newly appointed role, which we're excited to dig into. I know one of the things that you talked a lot about in your first interview was, you know, your origins in medicine and kind of the path to, you know, from chief resident to, to now dean, and we'll talk about that in a second. Tell us a little bit about, you know, where the passion for medicines came from. I know it's highly personal to you. I think everybody has a different, you know, calling for medicine. And I think the calling is very important right now, especially in the pandemic, because you know, you don't enter these jobs because of the money only or because of, you know, fame or prestige, you know, like we've really seen that you've got to have this intrinsic calling. And for me, that started with my family. Um, My brother has spina bifida. And so I really grew up as on the other side of you know, the, um, the doctor patient relationship as the, as the caregiver, um, and the family member. And so, um, growing up as a, a child of immigrants, um, who were not doctors and, um, realizing that th- there was something missing, you know, they, whenever they came home from a doctor's appointment, there were so many questions, uh, but the way they idolized doctors and that way doctors were so important to my brother's health and welfare was also really impressive, uh, particularly at times when he, needed emergency care um, or needed life-saving care. And so um, so those were all things that really inspired me growing up um, to really think about this field um, because it was, I always was attracted to science and math, you know, and sort of STEM oriented. Um, but this, this field had the opportunity to really make a big impact on patient lives. And so that's what really inspired me. And what's really unique about your path is you've been pretty early on passionate about this area of medical education. Where did that interest come from? I think starting with those early kitchen table conversations with my parents, trying to understand what it is that the doctor said, you know, you realize the power of education, you know, and the power of communication, particularly. I mean, education really is how do we communicate, you know, these uh, very um, complex concepts, you know, um, how do we train the doctors of the future? I would say that I uh, got more interested in teaching I, when I was at Johns Hopkins as an undergraduate. Um, I, you know, worked several jobs, and one of the jobs that I worked um, was uh, at, as a tutor. And so I had that sort of passion for simplifying concepts. You know, um, so how do we break it down and simplify it for other people? Um, interestingly, my other uh, job that I had was raising money for the university. And so I'm leaning on both of those skills right now. Um, and so you never know that the jobs that you hold, like those skills might come back to you <laughs> to, to help you later. Um, so I, um, so then I, I knew that I had that experience and I really enjoyed tutoring. Um, and I really, people thought I was good at it. So I thought, okay, let me continue this. So in medical school, I was probably fairly unusual in, in nowadays, I held a job during medical school. It was a little bit more common at that time, but not not common, but it was not unusual. Um, and so I um, I continued to tutor and I and I taught for the MCAT. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, again, I was always grown up with this idea of, you know, what can you do to make a difference? And, um, you know, and given that I did not come from a family of, you know, immense wealth, you know, where, where I could help offset those personal expenses and medical school really did matter. Those things really, really mattered. Um, and so I, um, so I took up a job, um, teaching, um, MCAT for, uh, pre-meds at Wash U, uh, in, uh, St. Louis. Um, so I kept going with the, with the teaching, um, and then I realized, um, you know, when I got to residency, um, that there was 
there was a potential career out of this. I didn't really know that um, going into residency, but then I saw, um, you know, saw mentors like my program director, um, Dr. Holly Humphrey, sort of make a career out of, you know, teaching, you know, in, in medical education. And that was very inspiring. And I had not ever seen that before. I'd only been exposed to really research or clinical practice. Um, and so I started to learn more about that. Um, and that's, uh, that's sort of what inspired me to, to really continue down this path, if you will. Wow, that's fascinating. It's fun, kind of fun to see some of that come full circle for you. I know, as you know, we like to ask all of our guests, you know, how you think about your foray into healthcare leadership, which is a little bit different from kind of the early days of clinical practice exclusively. Your answer was, was quite interesting, right? You said it was a little bit accidental from like a publication point of view, but then in some ways it was uh, intentional and you've got a great story about your um, raising your hand for chief resident. Tell us a little bit about kind of that entrance into leadership and then more specifically how you've thought about um, kind of the most re recent three to five years and kind of th this path to this new role that you're on. I'm on a Facebook group of physician women leaders, and it's interesting how accidental leadership does happen uh, because I think what happens is if you're good at what you do and you like everything, you know, so I'm a generalist, you know, um, and, you know, I, I invest a lot in what I do. Um, and I like everything. Those are the types of things that end up then kind of being valued at the leadership level because you can sort of relate to a lot of different things. And so as opposed to being a specialist where I was really narrowly good at one thing, um, I sort of dabbled in a lot of different things. And so I think that that was interesting in the sense that sometimes that's not rewarded in academia, but it's very valued in leadership. Um, and um, when I think about my own path, you know, I certainly think about those early days as a chief resident, uh, but I actually, um, I actually, my first leadership position um, ever um, was actually president of our high school band. And so um, and I mentioned that because, you know, ba band is, you know, high school bands are made of musicians and this was a marching band. So this is Per personalities, you know, fiefdoms, you know, flutists and clarinetists and, you know, trumpet, you know, brass, percussion, very different personalities. Um, but they all come together and they produce great music together and great routines and um, amazing pride and create a create a community. And um, and so I ended up um you know, being elected as president of the band, partly because I had volunteered to serve as a student government representative. Um, and no one in the band wanted to do this, but I was sort of interested in it. I've always had an interest in policy and representation and advocacy. So I thought, okay, well, this is my opportunity to, um, to understand, you know, how to how to make the school better. And I, um, so because I volunteered for that, I would give the report outs to, because it was second period, I would give the report outs to student government. And I feel that that is why my band conductor, you know, was like, you should run for president. And I, initially I was like, that sounds odd, you know, because usually the president was, you know, the, the most, uh, you know, um, talented musician. And I, I'll be honest, I was not the most talented musician. There's a reason well, what instrument did you play? I have to I ask. Played clarinet, and I enjoyed okay. it. I really enjoyed it, but I was not, you know, I, I took lessons. I, you know, it, it took hard work, but I was not naturally gifted. You know, I had people of this band went on to major in music in college and I stopped playing, um, after I left high school. But as a band president, you realize the need to really um, appeal to everybody and take in everyone's opinion and make sure that um, make sure that you um, were representing people's needs and views um, and also getting great ideas. So I think about a lot of those things now because um, sounds corny, but you know those are those were early early experiences that that really um, shaped who I am today. Um, and they don't have anything to do with medical leadership. Uh, they are really just emotional, you know, emotional intelligence, if you will. And so, um, so I think a lot about that when I think about medical students and residents. We see a lot of people who've had 
team experiences, you know, athletes do very well, you know, um, and become leaders um, because of those similar experiences. And so while I wasn't athletically gifted or musically talented, I, I found an avenue for myself. And um, and so I think that is uh, an important thing to highlight. And medicine, the career in medicine is very long, you know, and burnout is the norm. I mean, it's not you know, we should say you will burn out. You will have burnout. That is an occupational hazard of our profession. Um, should it be that way? It shouldn't. But that's something that we need to be to reconcile is that it, the, the cur current environment is that this is the case. But I always say to the students and residents, what are the, some of the things that really give you joy that I can keep talking about when we're working together? You know, and so I remember working with one intern during Christmas one year who was very burned out early in my career, and he was really interested in preventive medicine. And of course, we were now on our, he was on his fourth inpatient month and, you know, dealing with all the ills of hospital care. And so I ended up uh, saying, hey, let's talk about preventive medicine, this new article came out and, you know, find out what, what allows people to continue their passion and allow them to continue going with it. And so I think that's what leaders do, right? Leaders help uh, people really grow. And, um, and so, um, so I would say that my experience is early on, but also later as a research mentor, I've, I've, you know, my path was a little bit circuitous because I did do a lot of research, but as a mentor and a teacher, um, I ended up, you know, really, um, realizing the thing that I love most about research was mentoring. And what do I love about mentoring? It's really growing somebody to become that independent um, thinker in research. Um, those are all things that I bring to the leadership table. You know, every day I think about those things when I meet with a, either, you know, meet with a faculty member all the way to a pre-med student. That's so well said. And I think, you know, one of the reasons that we, we thought about envisioning the special series is, is exactly that, to kind of highlight these very unique backgrounds, both kind of coming into medicine, but also what you can do being trained as a clinician, right? That you don't have to just have the traditional kind of job that we think exists. And so I'm curious, you know, even in your current role, how do you think about um, exposing students to these different career paths within medicine, right? It could be patient, you know, front lines of patients. It could be the administrative leadership side. It could be, you know, in the media side. Like, how, how do you think about that? We have a long way to go. So that's one of my passions uh, because I think that, uh, you know, our, our medical education curricula is fairly, um, you know, static. Um, and so we've sort of languished on this, let's do multiple choice questions and high stakes testing. And then, and then we'll just immerse people into the wards, you know, and see what they see, what sticks, you know? Um, I think we could be doing a much, much better job with how we train our health professionals of the future. Um, and particularly in, uh, you know, passionate about physicians, I would say that, um, you know, one of the things that we know um, for physicians is many times they actually are serving on teams and serving as leaders of teams um, or helping teams grow. And so great example, what's the teamwork competencies that they're getting? How do we, you know, some of the things that I know, I, I went to uh, public policy school. And so I had some of this exposure to sort of running a team and how do you manage diverse voices? Those are not typical things uh, that are taught in medical school, you know, uh, conflict management and negotiation. And I think those are the same things where women in medicine suffer too, because we never learned those things. Um, and so um, and back to your question about exposure, I think that a lot of it is about um, coaching and mentorship and um, and then deliberate um, exposure to well-functioning teams and practices that allow people to decide, you know, is this something that I want to be doing or not? Um, at the same time that it's not a shadowing experience, you know, so I think that when I think about shadowing, I think about high school students or college students, but for medical students, we really need to be thinking about them as adults. And the pandemic has shown that. I mean, um, the AMA um, issued a call for 
um, you know, health system science, you know, impact challenge for medical students and residents. Over a hundred great ideas submitted of people in their organizations, medical students leading change, getting PPE, helping with literature reviews, um, offloading um, certain activities. Um, you know, even I read a recent article about medical students um, helping with loneliness in the community by doing those calls, telemedicine. A lot of our own medical students um, did a man telemedicine lines. These are all early preclinical medical students, you know, so we, we, we dwell a lot in medicine on scope of practice and supervision. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I'm like, we're not utilizing our medical students in a way that really respects that they are adult learners and could be contributing to the health system. And so um, those are some of the things uh, that we are hoping to do here now at Pritzker. And we just launched this new um, curriculum evolution process. Um, and so we are evolving our curriculum to really try to keep pace with all the changes that have happened. Um, and, um, and I'm very excited about the process and about the co-creation. We've invited our students and our faculty and our alumni and others to contribute to say, what ideas should we bring to the forefront? And do you want to help? Um, so I do think that there, there, we are at an opportunity. We have a huge opportunity. Another big area that we need to address is anti-racism and DEI issues, um, particularly given the issues that medical education um, was uh, one of the areas that had the, the most barriers to entry, particularly for Black physicians and prevented good care for black patients. We need to reckon with that. We need to figure out how do we make amends for that, the fact that the Flexner Report closed all but two black medical schools in the United States. And so those are some of the things that I think about and lose sleep over, honestly, on a daily basis as you know, things that we must be, be thinking about doing and exposing our students and inspiring them to be part of the change. Your passion for this area is just is so evident and it's really palpable. And so thank you for all that you do. I think one of the unique things about you from, from my vantage point is not being a clinician is you were one of the first to, in some ways, take the national stage through social media and start voicing a lot of these uh, issues and raising awareness and educating both those in the medical community, but, but those beyond that. How do you view social media and some of those platforms as key to kind of your your mission as you kind of work to to really permeate some of these longstanding traditions of medical education? Uh, I started on Twitter in 2009, and I uh, why did I start? Well, curiosity. You know, I have uh, you know one of my really close friends from Johns Hopkins. My college roommate is in health IT, and um, you know she was like, you know, you've got you've got so many great ideas, you're doing all this great stuff, you should join Twitter. And I was like, I don't even know what Twitter is, you know? And um, so I had a Twitter mentor, a twenter, you know, who kind of helped me get on Twitter. And then all I did was lurk for a while because I was scared. I was like, I don't, I don't want to say anything in the wide open. I mean, in, in medicine, I mean, that's like heretical, you know, that you're going to talk about your career on a, on a platform like that in 2009. And, um, and I was junior at the time. I was still, you know, assistant professor, I think, you know, and I ended up, um, you know, just lurking for a while. You know, I lurked and I, I learned. Um, and I realized that there was a space because I, I remember seeing people mixing up, confusing what students and residents were. You know, like they would be like, oh, you know, they'd refer to an article and they'd be like, oh, this medical student. But when you read, it's like a resident physician. Um, or people would be, at that time, people were... Um, and even now, but at that time, duty hours and resident fatigue and sleep was a big issue. And I had done a lot of research in the area. Um, and people always, you know, had one view or the other, like the public, but didn't see both sides of the equation. And so, um, you know, I realized that there was a potential opportunity there to educate the public. So I actually, um, you know, a lot of people ask me, did I take to social media to educate my my students or my residents? And I was like, no, because they're unfortunately with me in person and have to deal with me like in the room. And um, and um, and I would never be like, oh, go get on Twitter and follow me, you know, to see what I said. But I realized there was this community of people who I would um, never have reached, um, who I can actually highlight some of the issues that we're facing in medical education. So I started tweeting about medical education under the um, handle Future Docs in 2009. I did not tell anybody in my organization I was doing this. I did look at the policies, but like I didn't have it in my handle. You know, if you found me because you were on Twitter, okay. 
but you're on Twitter too. So that's embarrassing for you as well. So that was my philosophy, which is that if you stumble upon me and find me and then try to catch, you know, for my organization, I'll be like, well, what were you doing there? You know? Um, and so, um, it's interesting how my career has grown with Twitter, um, because it was not accepted at the time, you know? Um, and then I, and then it grew to become accepted, you know? And so, um, and then it's grown to be vital. I mean, it's been vital in the pandemic, but like with all things, it's like real life, right? Um, what was interesting about early Twitter is um, early Twitter was this place where you could connect with people like really, you know, across um, great dis geographic distance as well as across profession to be like, oh, let me learn more about each other. Um, and um, right now, I think, unfortunately, it's become a little bit more of an echo chamber. And, um, and it provides a different function. It probably provides a supporting function. You know, students and residents, faculty, you know, med Twitter has taken a life on its own. It's, it's, it's not as easy now to connect with people in different spaces. Um, so I do worry that it's become increasingly polarized. And certainly there are costs for engaging. You know, you, you can get attacked and harassed, and we've done research into that, especially if you're a woman, it's even worse. Um, but at the same time, it's an important component of our society um, because um, what I would say is that social media is an extension of real life. You know, all the bad things that happen in real life are now happening on social media. And, and unfortunately that you can't protect that. And, um, and so, and that's why, um, as long as our patients are there and our learners are there, we need to be there too, to engage and better understand, um, but, but it is interesting in the sense that, you know, uh, Twitter is just one platform. There's Instagram now, there's Clubhouse, so many different others. Um, early Clubhouse, you know, now reminds me of early Twitter, you know, and what will it become? Right now, it's very civil, usually, you know, I, you know a lot of connecting. I, you know, I can, I can walk into a room on Japanese anime and, you know, listen in and ask a question. I don't know that that'll feel so comfortable in the future. So, um, so it's our job to really be good stewards. Um, and think about that. And so I, um, I will say that, um, you know, I think a lot of our students and residents do have, um, have to learn about this because social media is also an important extension of their professional identity, uh, particularly in getting a job, like on LinkedIn, you know, um, are you on LinkedIn? Are you connected with others? Um, so there is pros and cons with all these technologies and we need to be teaching about them as well. I love that you've kind of created this movement around it because to your point, it's the world that we live in now. And so I think there are many women out there who are experiencing a little bit of that hesitation of, you know, should I be putting my voice out there? You know, is it worth, you know, the additional time that it, that's meant to be? But it's almost like if you don't exist there, you don't exist professionally. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I will say I my, it's funny. My husband is not on, um, you know, not on Twitter, uh, you know, and although he does lurk, so which I learned recently to great <laughs> to great chagrin, uh, but I, um, you know, it is interesting in the sense that you can have a very um, you know successful vital career, but for women in particular, I do think there's something about being on social media that allows for greater connection. Now, having said that, we did the study that showed that uh, women physicians in particular don't get as much bang for their buck in terms of external speaking opportunities and research collaborations. Um, and so, so again, it's that double-edged sword, right? It's social media was marketed as this, you know, great leveler, you know, of the playing field for hierarchy and, you know, way to help, um, especially people advance. Um, and, and I have been part of saying that that's, that's how I advanced. Um, but at the same time, um, with all technologies, right, and with all, that mimic real life, there is inherent bias. And so how do we counteract the bias? That's the human element. And so so I think these are things that are all very fascinating for me um, that I have really um, come to come to enjoy learning about, uh, but also how to improve. Um, I will say social media for me is also in my current job. It's been incredible outlet for me to learn. Uh, because, you know, people when, you, you know, all of a sudden now I have this title and people don't tell me things, you know, they're, you know, it's not like, you know, I, I mean, I have this great relationship with so many people, but there, I do sense that there is like this sort of people get a little stiffer when I walk into a room. Um, and like when I'm in the hospital, you know, I mean, I'm a hospitalist and, you know, I, my former job, I routinely would round on the work rooms and, you know, do, uh, you know, I, I, I had, it, uh, you know, was working as associate chief medical officer. So, you know, it's kind of germane to be in the hospital doing things. And 
when I walk into the hospital now, people are like, oh, you know, is everything okay? You know, you know so, so, you know, as if I'm there to check on something. So I do, um, I do think that, um, unfortunately, as you get to become higher in leadership, you get further away from the front line and the people that you're trying to support. And so um, for me, social media gives me a little bit of that. What's the pulse of what people nationally are thinking at that level? And how does that impact me here in Chicago? And how should I think about that when I'm when I'm preparing remarks or when I'm thinking about a, a policy or a change that affects something that's happening, you know? So, so those are just some of the things that I'm, that I'm thinking about when I look at social media these days. So it's interesting you mentioned that now in this new role, you've, you've noticed a little bit of a shift there. Uh, I'm curious. So you are now, most people think about like the first 90 days of a new role. You are uh, what about day 60 or so, if I got the math right on that. So what has been um, the most, Let's we'll start with the most challenging part of kind of taking on this new role and, and getting adjusted. It's honestly the most challenging part of any new job is the cadence and and putting yourself in the mindset. Um, I mean, so just even being here in this office, talking to you, you know, ha- having fixed up the office, you know, it's that mindset where it's like, okay, this is my job. I am the dean, you know, uh, you know people call me Dean Aurora and I'm like, who are you talking about? You know? So I, I still have that, you know, imposter syndrome and, um, and some distance, you know, cause it's so new. Um, but, but, you know, so, so I still remember, I mean, I remember being at a virtual meeting and everyone had to introduce themselves. And I said, well, I am the, and I paused Dean for medical education. So, so, you know, it's still tr- not rolling off my tongue as, as well as it could. Um, so it's really about your mental mindset. Um, and your cadence of your work day. You know, what's your work day look like? What's the right cadence of meetings to be having with people? Um, in a leadership job, you inherit a team. You know, I mean, it's, it's unless you're maybe you're an entrepreneur and you're kind of bringing your own team, uh, which I've had that experience of, you know, creating a team. But in, in this job, you know, you're inheriting a team. And you one of the things that happens when a new leader comes in is people get very nervous about their about their longevity, about their about their prospects, about their work, you know, um, about their value, making sure that they're valued. And so I think that's one of the things that I would say has been not a challenge, but I've really enjoyed having these conversations, but certainly um, requires dedicated time and thought to cultivating the team, getting in that cadence, how it should we be meeting every week, every other week, is this the right time? Um, because it's also an opportunity to revisit doing things differently. And so some people on the team are ready for doing things differently and other te- people might be like like the status quo. And so and there's also when you think about it many different functions of of a team and an, an organization like this that's trying to produce uh physicians. Um and so you know, I think about this, there's a four quadrant model, you know, and I think about, well, what are the things that, that people are ready to turn around? Cause they're like, you know what, we need to do things differently. You know? So a lot of times I did this listening tour to understand where do we have that capacity for change? And then where are we sustaining? Where, where are we successful that, that people are nervous that programs are going to be, you know, defunded or, you know, not be thoughtful about. Those are the things that I want to dispel and say, hey, these are important things that we want to, we want to highlight. And so again, it's sort of um, modeling the culture, supporting the people and uh, making sure that you yourself have wrapped your head around the role. So those are the three big challenges that I think of every day. Well, it's interesting you mentioned, you know, there's the mindset piece in a new role, and I'm sure you get this all the time, and I see it on my side too, where, you know, especially women say, well, whether it's founding a company or taking on a new leadership role, it's like, I don't know how to do that, right? Like, that, I, I didn't learn to do that. I didn't train to do that. And so where do I start? And so I can't imagine, I haven't checked the literature, but I don't know that there are many books out there that are you know, like, how to be dean of medical education, right? You kind of just figure it out. But I'm curious, like, mindset aside, whether it was more technical skills or just kind of preparing for some of these things, like, did you do anything for yourself in terms of bridging the learning knowledge for you or things that you read or people you talked to? What was that process like? Leadership is leadership is leadership, right? It doesn't matter where that leadership is. 
I, um, as associate CMO in my prior job, I worked for, um, you know, somebody who I work, still work with today. And, um, you know, he's our chief medical officer. And I remember leaning on him a lot, you know, to say, um, you know, tell me a little bit more about, you know, about this, about, about the platform that you have and sort of how you, how you approach your team, you know, and I had a lot of opportunities to learn this directly because I was on his team. And um, so a lot of times you seek to emulate leaders that you respect. And so for me, you know, that included my former mentors, um, people that I'd worked for, um, as well as external people that you admire from afar. You know, um, I am very close with um, the CEO of the American College of Physicians, uh, Darryl, Dr. Daryl and Moyer, um, as well as the CEO of the Council of Medical Subspecialty Societies, uh, Dr. Helen Burston, who's another speaker at the Women in Medicine Summit. These are women who I believe have really achieved so much, but also not... Um, They've they've done it in a way and in a style that I seek to emulate, and so um, in a collaborative, um, you know, way that's been very very effective. And so, um, and similarly, um, I thought about um, you know one one thing that my former boss told me was that you know keep in mind that you know at the end of the day. Um, a, you know, your skill set and your expertise is one aspect, but your ability to lead is something that translates across leadership positions. And, and that gave me a little bit of, um, you know, confidence to kind of go forward. The other thing that gave me great confidence is asking for help because I have a great team and um, I also have a great network and I can ask for help. I mean, I can reach out to the dean at uh, for medical education at University of Colorado and say she happens to be an ID physician and say, hmm, "What do you think about this COVID thing and students and you know, et cetera?" So, um, so uh, you know, I I and I use those lifelines. I use them on a daily basis. And so, don't be afraid to ask for help. And I think that is very important as a new leader uh, because you're not only asking for help within your team, you're asking for help outside of your team. Um, across your organization, but you're also making new lifelines. And so interestingly, I went, even though I'm at the same organization, I went from working at the hospital to working in the university. And um, I would say some of the people that have been most helpful to me in the you know, first few weeks of my job were university officials and university lawyers and uni campus, you know, the folks that really run the campus, the provost's office. I had very little insight into what that office does and what they do um, other than, you know, oh, you know, they, you know, you might get a call from the provost if something good happened or something bad happened. Uh, but I, uh, I've come to have a deeper respect for those lifelines. And so I think that's where having those first few days on the job mapping out, well, who, who are my go-to people, not just on my team, but outside of my team, because my team might have questions that I cannot answer. Um, and, and you do not need to be the expert in everything. What you need to do is be the convener and be able to get to an answer that everybody supports. And oftentimes that, um, um, or provide the answer, sometimes it's an unpopular answer, but provide it in a way that everybody can support it. You know, can you get behind this? Um, and so, um, so I would say those are, those have been what's guided me. And I, you know, I, I will say every day I'm challenged with something new and every day I reach out to somebody new and say, Hey, I'm new. And, you know, please help me. And, um, and I, I think that, and some part of me, you know, of course that, that can feel very disc, disc, uh, you know, uncomfortable. That can feel very uncomfortable, disconcerting because, as a leader, you think I should have all the answers, but it's like being an attending physician. You do not have all the answers for the patient. Sometimes the best answer is, I don't know, that's a great question. Let me do some sleuthing and find the expert and get back to you. And that's leadership. And so that's sometimes what we need to model. That's really great perspective and really well said. I'm curious then, are you still practicing clinically? Yeah. Yeah, I am. I I uh, I will be on service in October. I 
Um, I'm looking forward to it. I'm actually doing a lot of, um, you know, again, I'm looking for ways to maintain a presence in the clinical environment. Um, so I'm doing a lot of case conference, you know, um, trying to, again, get that cadence right. You know, so what's that cadence of when I'm going to be at resident report or I'm going to round with the teams, you know, or I'm going to check in with our students. And so, um, you know, I think that having face time with learners is critical in this job. And, um, and my prior job, it was having FaceTime with clinicians. And so, um, so they're very similar constituents um, and sometimes overlapping, for example, in the case of residents. I'm still, still figuring out that cadence. And um, uh, maybe the next time we talk, I'll let you know how my clinical Yeah, job. I will be interested to hear how that, how that evolves. I've started to reach out to the chief residents and others to sort of say, okay, how is it going to work? You know, and, and, and so I'm going to try it out. And um, I... I think it's very important that um, leaders maintain, uh, physician leaders particularly, maintain their clinical presence, especially in jobs like this. And in our organization, in fact, the only person that does not have a clinical footprint um, who is a physician is actually the dean of the entire you know, biological sciences division. Um, and so it's pretty unique um, to not have a clinical footprint. And so I, I, would, I would aim to continue to do something. Let's take a step back then in terms of the road to actually getting to the seat that you're sitting in today. As you, you and I both know, it's less than about 18% of women or, you know, deans of, of medical schools. Then you can break that out further, just generally about women represented in academic medicine leadership roles. What was the process like getting to this specific role? Was it something that you interviewed for? I know you've been with UChicago for quite some time. How did that play out? That is such an interesting question because I've given talks, you know, I've spent like 20 years here, you know, um, and uh, assumed this job 20 years to the day I finished residency here. So I, um, and sometimes that is overwhelming. <laughs> and uh, um, I would say that, um, you know, it's like aging in place, right? There's a very different set of core competencies to survive and, and succeed in the same organization um, as to move to a different organization. And so I think when you move to a different organization, and I don't have the experience of this, but seeing others, um, oftentimes you get a little bit of that honeymoon period where you're the new leader and you can, um, you're in the learning mode, you're new, you're, you know, you're the shiny new person who's come that people want to meet. When you're in the same organization, sometimes the hardest thing is that you are still doing your old job and people don't even see that you have a new job. And even though they know, it's like, well, of course, she's going to continue to do this. Um, and then the other thing is that you don't necessarily get the honeymoon period because you've got just this overlap, you know. Um, and a lot of people who um, who do uh, leave, you know, actually, of course, it's worse because you have to move your family and your your uh, your often you're moving across the country. They will have that break, you know, of I've stopped this job and I'm starting this job. Um, I did not have that. It was sort of like this overlap, you know, this, uh, you know, I was ramping down certain things and ramping up certain things. Um, in terms of the, um, and so that's a challenge. So I would say that's definitely helped me get the mindset, but it also was overwhelming. It was an incredibly overwhelming period in the spring after it was announced because I sort of had started being pulled into it right away, you know, and so. Um, so great example, I, the academic calendar starts before July 1st. So I was welcoming new residents to the organization. And on the slide, I put the almost Dean for medical education because I'm not the Dean for medical education. Um, and I was like, well, here, well, here we go. You know, if you're nervous, think about how I feel. And so, um, and so, uh, I think it's good to have that human quality to it. So people understand that you're, you yourself are a work in progress. Um, in terms of, um, you know, the job, I, they did an internal search for this position. And why did they do an internal search? Likely because, you know, a job like this does require a lot of um, understanding of internal culture. But because we also were in the middle of an accreditation cycle and a lot of other things, sometimes with an external search, as you know, 
there's high risk for failure and postpone. And they, they really needed somebody to go with the beginning of the academic calendar. And especially with the pandemic, you know, it was, it was vital that somebody was put in place. So the interesting thing about inter internal search is that you're up against your colleagues, you know? And so, you know, for this position, they did broad nominations. I, I don't, I think it was like 40 people got nominated and you know that, so I, I don't know the exact stats, but, um, there are people in our organization who I don't know, everything was kept very tightly sealed that have interviewed for this position who then received that note that, you know, that I am now the leader and that they, you know, that they either potentially working on my team or are, you know, looking to, you know, have a role here. And I will say that um, I've been gifted with an incredible culture where that that has allow been allowed to happen and it's been very well received. And so I don't feel... Um, you know, I don't feel um, any ill will from that process because I think the search was handled so professionally. Um, and so whatever you do, it's more to have a rigorous process. I have um, participated in external searches and I have externally looked at things before where I've not gotten a job. And um, and I've also had been in an internal search here where I didn't get the job. So I also have had the experience of going up for something, not getting it. Um, and then, you know, being part of the team and working with somebody else in that role. And I will say that um, from above all else, the transparency is what matters most, is that you had an opportunity. And so by listing the position, what you, what you don't want, especially for women, is for this to become like a networking game where it's like, well, who do you think should get this job? Okay, let's talk to them. You want it to be um, an even playing field where everyone has an opportunity to weigh in and throw their hat in the ring. Um, and, and that's what I think above all is the transparency is, is vital. And so we've adopted that model to actually, um, do two faculty director searches that are underway right now. And we've got amazing candidates. I don't know who's going to be the person who are in these roles, but I'm excited about the search. And I'm most of all excited that everybody who has interviewed had the opportunity to throw their hat in the ring because they will be better for it regardless. And I would say, even for the job I didn't get, I was better at interviewing. I was a better leader because I had had the opportunity to interview for the job. I think as far as throwing a hat in the ring, that's one thing I don't want to gloss over. In your last interview, I think what resonated so clearly was this idea of you rose your hand and you said, you know, pick me, you know, when the chief president yeah. consideration, right? I mean, and that's not easy to do. And from everything you're talking about, from finding your voice on social media and kind yeah. of trying to, to encourage, you know, more women in particular to kind of step forward, but just physicians generally, when the search was announced, did you actually, you know, intentionally put your name in in the hat there or was it a you were nominated or I'm sure it was a combination of the two but just to stress the emphasis of you I presume you you actually put put yourself in the running there I did receive a note that said I was nominated which was incredibly humbling and then I had to think about it you know because I you know, I had um you know I have a lab I have a, I was tenured chaired professor you know I I I didn't have a bad gig, if you will. You know, I, I had, I was doing well. And so, um, in some ways, um, that's sort of the best time to think about a, a career change when you're doing well, as opposed to when you're not doing well, because you're not, uh, when you're not doing well, you know, your mindset is just clouded by that. And you might make decisions that are, that are rash because you're like, I need to get out of this current position. Um, and I know that's happened to some people. Um, but in my case, I wasn't, you know, part of me thinks, you know, you know, would I have been okay if I didn't throw my hat in the ring, you know, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but I, I, I did it because I was excited by the opportunity, not because I didn't like what I was doing. And so that I think is very important because, um, you know, first of all, if you find yourself in a position where you don't like what you're doing, you've got to change that. And there are many ways to think about changing that. But, but interviewing for a position that's not right for you or, or, you know, take, you know, going for a position that you don't think is going to be a good fit for you, that's not the right answer. Um, and so, um, so for me, it, the, I was in the moment, I had a moment where I could think, do I want to put my hat in the ring? And I could meet with people, mentors and leaders and say, should I put my hat in the ring, you know, and, um, and get those opinions. And, um, and I was fortunate in the sense that I've had a lot of, um, 
I've had a lot of experience with research and with um, publishing and with mentoring that I sort of felt that I was coming to a natural, you know, chapter end, if you will, and that I have, you know, a job like this, I view as, um, you know, you, you know, you want to make an impact, but it's, it's not like you're going to make an impact like in a week, you know, you're going to make an impact over years, um, and possibly over a decade, five to 10 years, um, if you're lucky and, uh, hopefully I'll be lucky. And, um, and, and so that was why I thought about this job because I thought, well, if I'm ever going to have that impact to really have a platform and really change the way we train future physicians in, in a positive way to align better with the needs of our nation and our health system and our communities, this was it. And it was the right time for me now, you know, with these 10 years. And so that was kind of what I was thinking. That distinction is, is really helpful. And, you know, Vinny, this has just been such an empowering interview. I have so many more questions asked, but for the sake of time, I'll, I'll probably wrap us up with one or two more. You have accomplished so much and have yet so much more to accomplish, and we're all excited to track your career. But you also wear many hats, right? So you've got your newest hat of, of Dean, and you uh, have a beautiful family. You're a mom. What advice do you have for other young I'll, – I'll focus on physicians for now – women physicians who are juggling more of the unpredictable nature of a, you know, clinical profession and a family. My daughter is, you know, starting school in a few days. Um, my son is 16 months. Um, and so when I took this job, I knew my number one concern was for them, you know, will I have enough time for them? And, um, and my advice to others, you know, is that, um, is that if you see yourself as a leader, you know, and going down this path, you will need a team and you will need a team at work and you will need a team at home. So I am not mother of the year. I am part of an amazing team that provides support for my family and my children. And I had to get more support for my team at home. And so, um, and so I'm not ashamed to say that. Um, you know, am I the one who's going to be, you know, um, you know, uh, always there for my children at five o'clock? No, I have five o'clock meetings here. You know, um, I would say as physicians, um, especially physicians and procedural areas and even clinic, you know, we, we all know how late clinic goes. Women physicians know that, you know, but as a leader, you can set some boundaries. And so the, the exciting thing about being a leader is you can create a culture that supports other women. And so a uh, great example is our staff, our, um, you know, our campus staff are, are coming back from, um, you know, are switching to uh, more in-person work arrangements after September 8th. But we had an opportunity for everyone to write in what were their needs. And um, if anyone wanted alternative work arrangements, they could ask for them. And so as a leader, you know, I wanted to be inclusive and say, we understand everyone has different needs. And even the pandemic, it's not like the pandemic's over and everything is okay. Um, people with small children, especially who are unvaccinated, are very vulnerable, um, especially those um, that are, um, you know, in, our, in jobs that are, you know, not at the highest echelon of, of pay grade where they can, where they can support um, nanny and caregivers like I can. And so we, um, as a school, have adopted a, um, a policy of alternative work arrangements for our staff um, to help support them. And so, so again, you know, every, you know, the idea is that, of course, we're here, we're in person, we're, we're supporting our students and our learners, but we have to have some flexibility to allow um, for people to, to be part of our workforce. Otherwise, we will not model the same uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion principles that we wish to recruit for. And so, um, and so that's the, the trade-off, right? Which is that, um, you know, yes, I have 5 p.m. meetings, and yes, I have evening things, um, and I have long days. Um, but the trade-off is, as a leader, sometimes I can set the agenda and the boundaries around those. Um, and I also can use some of the um, the, you know, the incentives that I receive to help bolster my team at home. And so 
I will say I have two teams and that team at home is what makes this job possible. And so that's, that's, I, I have to give a huge credit to my husband and, uh, and my kids. I mean, honestly, they, they rise the occasion as well as everyone who takes care of them. Wow. Well, that's, that's great advice. And thank you for all that you do. We're excited to, to see how the new school year goes and hopefully you'll, you'll join us back maybe a, a year in reflection, but congratulations again on the new role. And I know it's not easy starting it off in the middle of a pandemic, but you're off to a, a great start. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And it's, uh, it's great to be here again. 